the whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. It was basically a cube with inside of sphere where the points of the cube uh, were touching outside of the sphere. So this isn't anything that just is limited to the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. We've got a breakdown for you. We're recording this on the 23rd of January, recapping about the last week and a half's worth of news because there has been a few things happened and I did mean to record this last week but just stuff got in the way. So Dan, I finally managed to drag you from your Columbia prep on to record on the podcast again. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's going well. I, I'm almost prepared uh, two weeks today as we're recording this. I'll be on my way. So uh, it's getting very exciting. And for UK listeners, yourself and Vinny from Disclosure Team, who you're flying out with, uh, that's you're right, having yeah. a little meetup, aren't you? Uh, if you want to just mention, is it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Brewdog? Brewdog in Birmingham. So uh, if you go there, Vinny will be there from 1 p.m. Uh, I'll arrive for, for about, I think, 5.30. So if you can last that long, uh, drinking with Vinny, then uh, yeah, I'll be around to say hey. It'd be nice to see everyone's faces. Maybe thank right. some people if you... Uh, if, you were donated uh thank you again to everyone who did and um if you want to clear up a few details dan it's at 1 p.m when uh this is on sunday the 6th of february just in case anyone turns up at 1 p.m tomorrow yeah. or the and day after or... Birmingham in the uk as well just yes to, i was going to say not <laughs> birmingham alabama is the other one that i'm aware of so again if you're in alabama it is not happening out there it's birmingham uk which is a far stranger colder place yeah, uh, I can imagine. <laughs> Hi to all the listeners in Birmingham. So, uh, Dan, uh, just before we get into the news, which there's a lot to, to get through, um, just to clear up one thing, for listeners listening on Spotify, I had one of you get in touch with me recently to say you're still hearing adverts and sponsors uh, clips uh, on the premium service. This never really occurred to me that Spotify have their own service called Spotify Premium, where you pay um, for additional devices, all that kind of stuff. If you're looking to listen to the podcast on Spotify with no adverts, early access, bonus content, and no sponsor stuff, then you have to search on Spotify, that UFO podcast premium, and you'll see a separate feed where I upload the podcast early, like on Apple Premium or on Patreon, but you get all the good stuff as well without all the adverts and sponsors. So if you want to support, it's like £1.99, $2-ish. It's round about. It's less than the price of a Starbucks coffee, trust me which was £4.70 each day for me this week. So, so do, yeah. do listeners still get to hear your creative Manscaped adverts? No, um, I might upload those separately in a file to <laughs> for, for them separately. But yes, support the sponsors, folks. And thanks to those who still give us really nice feedback about the, the Manscaped reads and stuff as well. So might have a new sponsor coming on board soon. Um, so again, it's always a fun one to check out if you're listening on the free feeds as well. So I'll, I'll say no more. Other than if it comes off, I think Vinny will be very interested in it. Let's just say that much. But if you don't want to listen to sponsors and ads and all that nonsense, then uh, sign up to one of the premium services. It's like a dollar, a couple of dollars, a couple of pounds, euros, whatever currency it may be. Um, I, I do enjoy when people sign up with all these weird currencies and it's like... Any, any galactic credits yet? Nah, nothing. Not even any crypto yet. But <laughs> I, I don't even know how I would accept that. So I'm still a crypto... like. I'm not even a newbie, like just I, I just don't do it. But yeah, anyway, that was the, the clearing up the Spotify stuff. On to the cool news though, Dan. There's been quite a lot for early January for this so-called dry period we're going through. Um I think we've been we've been really lucky. News that broke just today, um, as we record this, is that Jacques Vallée has joined the Galileo project, which is which is awesome news. I think when it was announced, we were all really excited and looking forward to the potential of the project, the the mainstream aspect. Having a name like Avi Loeb and some of the benefactor, benefactors, I don't think it's the right word, but investors and, and people interested in the topic and subject, you ran through that on one of the breakdowns where you touched yeah. on, here are some of the names and affiliates of it. And then I think it took a little bit of a hit with some people that came on board, like Seth Shostak and, and one or two names like that, where folks went, ah, 
that's not really the people we want to be involved in this because they've been naysayers or people with agendas of their own where they've not really been very open-minded uh, given the subject that they're looking into. However, I think when, when Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon came on board, it was a big win for them and it's the people you want involved. And now to see countless others, but then Jacques Vallée joining it, it's it's fantastic and it's wonderful to see the energy Jacques has still at his age. You know, he's, he's no spring chicken, but the energy he has and the love and passion for this topic, which is still very much there for all to see. Yeah, Jack, Jack has been looking into this topic for decades and decades now. He has such a huge body of very respected work. Um, and he brings with him some, you know, you, you mentioned Seth Shostak there and Seth was part of SETI, where they were kind of open minded enough to go, OK, we'll look for alien life but assumed the aliens would be using radio signals like we do. You know, not very out of the box thinking, considering what they're trying to do. Um, they recently announced that they're going to be looking for lasers um, as communication signals. Um, so they're getting a little bit better, but I feel like Project Galileo is kind of pulling them into this direction because that is a completely open kind of study. Avi Loeb said in an interview that he, he kind of sees it as a fishing expedition. And he said that they're just looking for whatever they might find. And if it if it happens that they find a strange fish, then they'll deal with that when they get to it. With the addition of valet to the project, his he has a, a hypothesis called the control system where he thinks it's a kind of feedback loop to coax our consciousness forward into developing for whatever reason down certain parts. Um, so it's interesting to have him on board when his his... I want to say hypothesis but it's not quite his ideas are so you know out there mm. um and i think the the community really appreciates that balance that they have on board now yeah absolutely and, and the issue i had is um seti is such a wonderful tool potentially for the community and the subject the topic to have for whoever wants to drive it forward and the Galileo project again Dan I think at the time we talked about how it would be wonderful wonderful if all these different groups could collaborate and get together and you know UAPX if they they could be involved with what they are trying to do and they all talk to each other at least to to pull the resources I think that would be wonderful and the way SETI at times has, has come across under Seth Shostak's leadership, especially from some of the interviews I've listened to on on Howard Hughes, uh, Unexplained, where he's a regular guest. It sounds like you, you talk about Avi Loeb saying they're on a fishing trip. It seems to me at times Seth Shostak is the guy on the beach with binoculars looking the wrong way back onto land, <laughs> but telling them that they're not able to find water, but they should keep looking. Yeah, that's and a good like, analogy. You know, like the, the tool is fine. He's just not looking in the right places. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Um, so for me, I would still hope that any one of these people involved are, are the right people, including Seth Shostak. It would be great if, if one day they can find something soon. Uh, and again, he's one of the guys that goes, yeah, do you know what? I was I was wrong doing what I was doing or hedging our bets. And I think when that time comes, and we're going to probably touch on some of that within the, the next topic we're going to talk about, um, we don't need to be blaming people and holding people accountable. I think there's going to come a point that when we start to get some news on momentum in a big way, whether it's through the Galileo project, NASA, SETI, you know, some some foreign government finds something, you know, a Chinese rover, whatever it might be, we have to kind of move the conversation forward. And and we've got we've got our own colleagues in, in UAP media where we've had those conversations and some of those things where it's and it's fine to disagree people. I've always had this that I don't necessarily agree with some of my own colleagues that there are people that should be held accountable and all this kind of stuff where there's going to come a time where we have to move the conversation forward and, and looking back and blaming is maybe something that just has to get knocked on the head to use a, an old British phrase. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're going to have to kind of convince people that we're all on the same side here. And we've heard often in history through many different officials, they, they've wondered out loud at places like the UN, uh, how a force from outside of humanity could unite us in that way. So just remember we're all on the same side, I'd say. You know, we, we might have our differences, but hey, they make the world go round. Yeah, if you've seen Don't Look Up, it's a little bit like when they're about to launch the mission to to stop the asteroid, which I hope's not a spoiler, because, it, I mean, you can imagine where the movie goes, but then someone with their own agenda comes in and stops that. Even though it's for the betterment of everyone else, they come in and it's like, ah, and I, I would like to think when the next Oumuamua comes along, and we go to chase it, there's no one there saying, wait, stop, let's just think about this. No, let's do it. Let's go discover. Let's go Let's go make the most of this. And 
ultimately Jacques Vallée being on board is a wonderful get get for them. Um, so yeah, kudos to the Galileo project and everyone involved. Um, keep doing what you're doing, and I'm, I'm sure 2022 will be a big year for them too. And when there are, are some updates, we'll get Abby back on the podcast to talk about it. Next up, Dan, uh, Lou Elizondo was on Coast to Coast with George Knapp. Um, less than a week ago as we record this it was a big conversation um kudos to to joe murgia i think for a lot of people who didn't have access couldn't get access or prefer just to read the highlights uh, joe murgia transcribed and i think broke twitter's own servers with the, the length <laughs> of the transcription at one point um yeah that's fair to say he, he does a great job he he transcribes a lot of different uh interviews conversations you know things like that so ha- have a look at his account it's at ufo joe i think on twitter um well worth following I, s- I signed up to joe's patreon like again like i don't have a lot of money myself but for for me doing this podcast it's worth like a couple of pounds a couple of dollars to to thank someone like that and um I, I i use a lot of his transcription stuff from a load of interviews and he helps me pinpoint bits to go and listen to as well so yeah thank you thank you to joe murgia for for doing what he does um so yeah so lou was on coast to coast george knapp a good couple of hours interview which is fantastic i think lou's had a, a well-deserved break over the last kind of couple of weeks and, and months Um, he will be back on the podcast sooner than later folks that uh listener questions follow up is a uh, something that we're still going to do uh, in the very near future, hopefully as well. I, I but, never mind these big gaps between shows like that because yeah. so many people sent great questions in, but stuff's happened since then. So we can yeah. kind of come at things from different angles and, and you know, people can send in different questions. 100%. And, and as, as you listen to this, we've got John Ramirez back on Wednesday and it's a listener question show and I've got loads left over from the last one that we didn't get to just due to time constraints and already people are sending me more follow-ups and up-to-date questions so again if you want to send in a question before Wednesday uh, the 25th 26th uh, Wednesday 26th of yeah. January please do so UFO UAP AM at gmail.com for for John Ramirez but I'm looking forward to putting some of those listener questions to John but yes, anyway, Lou on Coast to Coast, Dan. Um, what to, was kind of to start off, can, yeah. can I just say, I thought it was funny that George's first question was asking Lou about how he felt walking onto the stage with uh, the TTSA press conference, because that's exactly where we left off in the uh, the profile we did with uh, Tom DeLong. Um, thank you for all the feedback to everyone that's given it, and we'll, we'll get more listener questions. So send those in, and we'll address those in, in part two. I'm just going to um, be really egotistical here and assume George listened to the Tom DeLong profile. And, uh, <laughs> that was how he started off his own interview with Lou by uh, researching hours. So, um, no, I'm, I'm sure he doesn't. George Knapp's an incredible interviewer. But, yeah, it was a nice uh, nice happenstance. And we kind of kick off part two in the, in the next week or so with, uh, with that as well. Um, but, yeah, so we were talking about some of the things that jumped out for me. It was a long interview, a huge transcription, if you're going back and look at that. Uh, public hearings, uh, I suppose, was one of the things that jumped out to me early on. Lou made the comment that if public hearings happen, people will be amazed at what ATIP actually found. It was a grab your popcorn comment from Lou. And it probably goes without saying, but I think at one point it was 5% of the stories been told, Lou said. Overall, yeah, that was a little right. bit later on. He but... was talking about his book a little bit, wasn't he? Yeah. Um... Yeah, 5%. So very curious what's going to be in there. A listener did ask about the book. I'll just touch on it because we're talking about the book, I guess. Yeah, uh, go on. Later on. Um, and Lou was uh, basically saying, oh, man, I can't find my notes now. That is typical, isn't it? <laughs> He's too busy looking up suitcases for Columbia. <laughs> I've got a big page of notes. Uh, hold on. This is, this, is cause we were, this is where we're, <laughs> we're going to jump about, though. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll not cut this bit because it, it gives Dan a lot more work to do. He's going to find them. But um, tell you what, well, do you want to come back to the book? I've got that it. That makes it easier. You got there's it. A, okay, there's cool. a control F find function. I just need to use my computer properly. Um, yeah, Lou, Lou said that he's writing the book for a very, very specific reason that will be clear when it comes out. Uh, he hopes it's extremely informative and in the same breath says that he's working on, with a group of people, what he sees as the definitive UAP documentary. Uh, which, I mean, that'll be very exciting told from his point of view. And and I'm sure that will contain a lot of things that we haven't heard about or spoken about yet. And that's not the same documentary announced by Leslie Keane and CNN. I don't think it doesn't seem to have a link. If if there has been, I've not seen that. 
no, and, no, and no, hard link. Read, it's a different team. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, there may be involvement in cross pollination, but I, I'm not. I wouldn't confidently say they're the same thing. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're looking forward to Lou's book, abs- absolutely. So yeah, public hearings again. It's one of those things. If they happen, fantastic. It still seems at this point, as we sit in January 2022, even with all the progress we've had, a huge leap to have official public hearings where they're going to discuss UFOs and they're going to have to bring up the subject of ETs and the words potentially like spaceship being thrown about Congress. Yeah, because you're, I mean, you're, go- you're going to then, you're not going to only have your, your really interested politicians like your Ruben Gillios, all, all those all those folks and you're not going to have just them, you're going to have these politicians that will be sitting there going, Are we actually having this conversation? Like yeah. am I and there'll there'll be probably some guffawing and people that haven't been briefed or just been briefed that they can't believe the conversation that like I say they're they're having to have. So that for me will be really interesting. If if hear... we do get public hearings, I'm gonna track how the media portrays the issue throughout it, because I'm sure, like you say, you'll get some snarky comments at the beginning, but by the end of the hearings, uh, well, I guess I'll use the word somber again. Uh, That's probably what it would be like by the end. Timing, I think, would be a massive thing as well, though, wouldn't it, Dan? Because we've just seen that the world's went on hold for almost two years as we've went through a, a pandemic, which, again, I think I've said this before, but it looks like we're coming out the other end of now in the UK and in, in the coming weeks and months, all the restrictions are ending. Um, it would it would just take something else to happen on a, a global scale, a conflict somewhere, a disagreement, you know, an event that, again, could, could knock this back, couldn't it? And election time in various countries could be an issue that would knock this on, knock this to the back of a queue, of issues or, or bring it forward potentially i still don't see this being an issue that is going to be used to win an election would you i mean the if you look at the kind of original flea video and stuff on on youtube it has enough views that you know it could swing an election technically if every one of those views was a vote uh to, to look into the topic which is dubious but you know there is interest there is my point um and it would be interesting to see because it's law now that this office is going to be around to 2026. And yes, the next administration that comes in can get rid of it, but that would require passing bills too. And that would probably mean that people that put this through in the first place would argue against that. So we would kind of get arguments and discussions about UAP and probably ET and spaceships in that event too. So like Lou likes to say, the the ketchup's kind of out of the bottle now. What I would love to see though is... As in the last couple of years, Netflix created Space Force, which is a, a comedy, but again, has a lot of truth to to what we see in it and the way it's portrayed. But it's still a laugh and a joke at the US government having a Space Force and, and what it may or may not do and how it might actually be, be ran. I would love to see something about this new potential UFO office, but in a style of the West Wing, where the subject is treated, you know, properly and seriously and well written and dramatised and... I suppose it would be a potential a movie of Lou Elizondo's life would would be something if it was like an HBO yeah. Max series. I, I mean, you you can see you know other other biographies have been adapted into biopics, so you know it, it could happen. That would be very interesting. Um, but since you said it, I, I'm just picturing uh, Steve Carell in the DoD as he hears that uh, Senator Gillibrand is is passing this amendment and suddenly, you know, hits his desk over and screams, what? We'll we'll make our own UAP office first before they can do it. <laughs> and oh, it's listen, just all about that silly red tape. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Don't worry. Um, Lou, Lou made a comment uh, earlier on about it was this subject and, and being covered up as like rotten vegetables in the fridge. The longer the subject is, is left and avoided and ignored, the smell's going to get worse and there's going to be a lot more to clean up. And maybe now, and now is the time to start cleaning this up, which I liked. I liked that that message. Um, he mentioned two people by name who who tried to kill OSAP when it was a program. Um, Kate Borowicz, who was DIA, and Marcel Letra of the OUS. I, I'm maybe pronouncing that a little too French. Um, Letra, Letra, Letter, um, of the OUSDI. Didn't see much more on that, Dan. Um, this no, was, uh... I mean there there wasn't much follow up there. Um, Gary Reed was mentioned as well. 
um yeah. to which lou responded with i recognize that name my mum used to say if you got nothing good to say don't say yes. it, anything yeah. at all uh which telling right that that was the same breath that he kind of said about the hearings and sit do down you think, with popcorn if they happen do you think some of these people might be talked about maybe a little bit more in the book as as a more official process it might not be the most interesting conversation for Lou to have on on air and maybe there's, there's reasons he doesn't but maybe putting it down in a book for for reasons as to where he can clearly lay out a time time frame and chronological events of here's what happened here's what i was working on here are some of the people that tried to stop x y and z and he can it can lay that out as as proof you know yeah and and you would imagine that if those people i mean they they get an option we learn with the skin we'll book, walk a book um like Hatsky's one that you can they they have to submit it for kind of processing and for redactions. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if any of the people Lou mentions or departments he mentions or events he mentions um, are redacted, you, you know? Um, I believe they, they had to in the book kind of cite you or at least give reasons why and things like that. So that'll be interesting if that happens. Let me bring in a little bit of speculation here, potentially, because... He made the comment off the back of one of George Knapp's questions that ufologists looking for proof of alien bodies, go take a break, go learn the piano or the violin, check out for five years, then come back. Is the, the five years timescale in any way relevant, do you think? Am I doing that thing where I find a timescale and go, ha, five years, is is that when we're going to get pictures of alien bodies? I think maybe because Lou said five seconds when we were talking about the temporal stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so maybe it's just a convenient number. Or, or maybe, you know, it's the number at the base of the universe. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Uh, but, so he's probably just picking a random, like, arbitrary time scale there of come back in five years and you'll see the progress. I think we have talked about, haven't we, that in, in now just over four years, how much progress has been made, that by the end of this year, we could be looking at, wow, there's five years since this all came out and look where we are. And he's making the point that if you're really looking for some of that maybe more sensational stuff, I suppose with another five years time passing by, we could have had those congressional hearings, more incredible videos or photographic evidence come out, maybe that famed black triangle photo that everyone's, it's probably going to become internet myth, let's be honest, or internet legend, that, that <laughs> photograph. But yeah, what, what could have come out in, in five more years? Because... You would have to say, if we could go forward in time, Dan, which maybe there are species that can do that, as we've learned, if we could jump forward in time. We can go time, forward in time. Wait, watch. Yeah, oh, yeah we've done it. Yeah, We've yeah, done and it, yeah. There again. <laughs> yeah. Very good. But if if we could jump forward that five years and, and review the five years that have just been, if we weren't much further forward and we were still talking about the nimitz Princeton event, those three videos, the potential of a black triangular photo, the UFO office is set up, but you know, we've not heard much more from it yet, but it's doing lots of great work in the background. You would have to say, ah, that has been a bit disappointing, but I'm, I'm guessing and the what I'm taking from that, what Lou is saying is, you know, in five years, we're going to have a hell of a lot more progress of even more than what we've had already. And, and just wait. But for those of us who are interested in this and who want to podcast about it, or if you're listening to this right now, listening to us talk about it, then you can see how much just in the last week and a half, and we've still got more to talk about, has happened. Um, 2022 is going to be a knockout year, Lou said. How much you take from that will depend on which side of the Lou Elizondo fence you fall on. We don't have to say, you know, we, we are f fans of Lou, if you want to call it that, and, and we've got faith in him. But I think it's something that even if you're one of those people who aren't massively happy with, or, or you know, don't take everything Lou says, you know, face value and such that, it's something you're going to be able to come back in just 11 months and evaluate. Has 2022 been a knockout year? We're living it right now. And we should have, you know, some some big announcements, some setup of the office, Galileo Project really taking off UAPX in, in April with data coming out and, and any number of other things potentially. So Lou, at least you don't have to wait too um, long. Lou mentioned that they're trying to form an academic and civilian advisory boards mm. um, and that someone with a PhD in sociology um, is interested. And Lou goes on to discuss how basically the, the next questions, we're, we're no longer talking about are these things real? These things are there. It's how they affect us now as a species in different ways, uh, socially, financially, all these things that are really, really important. Um, and that's, I mean, that's what actually tackling this issue looks like on, on a proper scale, right? It's not about just looking at videos of lights in the sky. Um, it changes a lot on this globe. 
the phrase that's mentioned is we have to look at extending a hand and not a machine gun uh, yeah. going forward. And, and those are questions and conversations that you would hope are absolutely being had. Um, it's something that go, going back years, we've seen, you know, it mentioned that, that the Vatican has an interest in the subject. We have seen, you know, has the US government got a, a plan for, you know, if and when we make that contact? We've seen enough movies about it. You would like to think there's there's something there's something down there. I know it's something that Nick Pope mentioned that he had put forward years ago to the to the British government, but how much you could put into that, I, you know, was it just lip service to the Daily Star or you know, maybe <laughs> a, a other and, and that would probably serve a very specific kind of disclosure, right? Like yep. that, and any plan like that at the moment probably is pretty conservative and talking about okay, well, if the species comes from space and says hello, but we we know there's all this other weirdness in this subject. So, you know, what what happens if, or that plan, I should say, looks very different if suddenly we know there's a species that can just walk through walls and see all our secrets at will and, you, you know, we hide nothing from them, basically. Yeah, we've seen what happens in uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know, let's play some nice music, flash some lights and everything goes well. And we've seen Independence Day where let's flash some signals at this thing and it gets blown out the sky. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting conversation. Maybe a good what if down the line again, Dan. Yeah. The conversation always right now still goes back to drones, which is the the buzzword of the last couple of years, okay? Um, And Lou talks about the drones argument and goes back to rightly that, you know, we didn't have drones. Maybe you can use that argument now that, yeah, it's drones. Everything's drones. There was a football match in the UK stopped yesterday for, for 20 minutes because someone was flying a drone over the stadium. Now they clearly caught the drone on camera um, and a police helicopter had to come by for safety issues and all that kind of stuff. But... It's it's the easy one for even the general public now to throw. It's probably a drone. When you see something in the sky, you can't explain. But in the 50s and 60s, Lou mentions the Chinese never had any drones that could loiter about the Pacific Ocean. Um, and I think our friend Graham Rendell would attest to these sightings going back even further than that. And, yeah. and drone just happens to be the, the go-to word now. A really interesting point I thought that came up here was Lou talks about the drones buzzing the warships in 2019, you know, the Omaha, the Russell events, those those sorts of things that Corbell had come out with information through through George Knapp as well. And Lou mentions that after the 2000 USS Cole attack, these wouldn't be allowed to just, just be there. That was a, where basically a, a small boat was used to, to hit the side of a US ship and, yeah, yeah. and servicemen, servicemen and women that died in that event. Um We've heard and we discussed that these events where the ships go dark when there are drones buzzing about is so there can be less electronic data gathered by the, the drones if it is a foreign adversary, but also you can be collecting data from, from the other way as well. Yeah. But Lou, Lou doesn't say that. Lou says that these wouldn't be allowed to just sit there because they could potentially impact a ship, drop a bomb. It could be, you know, pirates, terrorists, any number of different things. It's not always just China or Russia or the US spying on each other. What were your thoughts on that, Dan? It, it was real interesting because, you know, they they have countermeasures that we know are sometimes successful, sometimes not. And when when you're dealing with, you know, trying to interfere with radio signals and things like that, we, we kind of have that skill down pat, you, you know, as a, as a thing that we can just do. Um, so to kind of see repeated incursions like this, not only get around those defenses, but render them essentially ineffective to the point where the ship just has to go dark and they just have to wait and see and probably just write down what happens and hope that nothing bad happens. Um, it leads to the conversation of, well, you know, have they been out knowing that these things can come to them? Um, with some tools on board to maybe try and coax them. And they do speak about that. Um, and they, there was a little bit of it interesting uh, data dropped by Tim McMillan uh, on social media not too long ago where it was mentioned about anti-neutrino mapping uh, because basically the nuclear processes give those off. So you can have a satellite in space now that essentially just identifies all the nuclear reactors around the world. So you can identify areas of interest for UAP essentially and also, if you could generate those, then without kind of nuclear material, then you can essentially bait a UAP without actually having that nuclear material. So this conversation is going somewhere very, very interesting. Um, if anyone wants to look at that data, uh, search the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency study of anti-neutrinos, and you can download a global map as well as the Google uh, Earth uh, overview data, which is very cool. You can kind of plot it against UAP. 
And yeah, surprise, surprise, there are nuclear correlations. Yes, and that's something I'll be going into with Tim McMillan because I've got him back on the podcast recording on the 28th of January for a release the following week. And we'll be talking about the upcoming office, or the information on drones, the anti-neutrinos article, easy for me to say, and some other stuff as well. So again, if you want to get some questions over very early for Tim, it's always a popular show at UFO, UAP, AM at gmail.com for Lieutenant Tim McMillan. So looking forward to that one, Dan. Um. Lou talks about the uh, the offices, the AOIMSG. Now, did you did you catch what the they're calling it internally? Oh, okay. uh, the AIM, uh, which for any Marvel fans out there is the kind of crappy version of Stark Industries. Uh, that that made me giggle a little bit. <laughs> it's well, we've always said it never rolls off the tongue, does it? Um, but no. Lou mentions and kind of laughs that one of the offices go- won't exist going forward. I imagine it's going to be the AOIMSG, which we have said for some time looks to be a diversionary. And you joked about it with the Space Force comment, Dan, didn't you? But yeah. it's very much been a, oh, look, look, well, look what I can do um, yeah, yeah, over absolutely. here. You, do, you don't need that. I'm doing this. Imagine I didn't want Dan to go to Columbia because I needed him to record something that week. So, Dan, instead of going to Columbia, I've actually uh, set up my own documentary. It's going to be on the lights of Northumberland, and we're going to hike up um, Northumberlandia. That's something you can Google, folks. I live very close <laughs> to that. Um, it's quite an interesting landmark. But yeah, we're going to hike up there, and we're going to look at the lights that have been seen above there, Dan. So yeah, there's no need for you to go to Columbia. That's pointless. This is getting done over here. So yeah, that's what they've kind of done is, is look over here. Don't worry about that. We are dealing with it. We are taking this seriously. You don't have to do that. And it doesn't seem like it's going to work. It seems on a really international, global, you know, important governmental level, quite petty. And yet here we are. Bureaucratic nonsense, I I would say. You know, Lou Lou points out that USDI is an oversight organization, so it can't actually do any investigation. So it can't fulfill the remit the Congress has just asked uh, of it. Um, So, you know, it can't possibly do it. It can't do the job, therefore it's not fit. To go with your analogy... Even further, it would be like you doing that and not actually having a production company in place in the first place. <laughs> so I just kind of show up and there's nothing to do, you know? That's the plan. Yeah, I, I don't have a production company. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. you, as long as you provide a lot of pie, I'll, I'll come. <laughs> yeah, me with a, a webcam plugged into a power bank, that would be the production <laughs> company. Um, listen, it gets the job done. So yeah, I thought that was an interesting, if albeit expected, comment from Lou. And again, I, I don't feel there's a need for that AOI MSG with, with what's being set up. Um, it doesn't seem like it's going to be the, the transparent office that we all hope it is. So um, interesting from our point of view, if you're outside of the US, that in 2022, more international cooperation at the official and unofficial level is to be expected as well. I mean, ourselves in the UK, Dan, doing a very small part with UAP Media and our colleagues, you know, Dave Partridge, Graham Rendo, Adam Goldsack, Vinnie Adams, to to kind of help the conversation forward as we can here. And I mentioned a few weeks ago, I think, and, and again, even just things like some of the articles that have gone out through various um, online services recently, different papers, we have been in touch with the journalists and it's even been things like getting them to correct some of the terminology they're using. If you saw the Daily Star headline and quotes about extraterrestrial nonsense that they had on, we are actively just trying to do little things in the background that, you know, for if, if a paper has a sizable readership, you know, can they take out phrasing like alien hunters and alien enthusiasts? And can you just talk about this seriously? And it's been very, very small battles. You know, this is when I talk about there's no call for politicians in the UK at the minute to en masse to discuss this in Parliament because we're still trying to get journalists to to change the wording of articles at the minute. So yeah. it's it's a grassroots movement, and it's great that we've got listeners getting in touch as well. To and, and no doubt, people who don't listen to the show as well. There's there's plenty of those. I mean, needless to say, there's more people who don't listen to the show than do. But it's great that people are being involved and in, in contacting local politicians and and saying that I'm trying to get in touch with them and I'm letting them know about an interest in the subject and and what's happening in the states and elsewhere in the world. So I'm I'm excited that we can be a very very small part in helping the change here in the UK. And if you're listening elsewhere in the world, you know, contact your own politicians, contact ju- contact local journalists. It doesn't, ha- doesn't always have to be a politician because journalists and newspapers, media outlets, 
those are the people as well who can have a huge say in, in what is discussed and what is the zeitgeist and, and everything in, in your own in your own kind of area as well. So I'm I'm hopeful from a UK point of view, Dan, that we, we can help out a little bit with that as well. Yeah, I, I think so. It's all about those kind of small battles. And even if it's just putting out on someone's radar that it exists and is being taken seriously, do it. Like, you know, the person's eyes might glaze over after that bit because it's a lot to take on. This is a huge paradigm shift. But if you just kind of stick with it and just seed those ideas out into the world, the conversation will change. This is how it happens. And for me, last point I want to bring up about the Lou Elizondo on Coast to Coast, I would thoroughly recommend people check it out themselves. There are ways and means to listen to it, or, or you can read Joe Margia's transcript. Uh, George Knapp talks about the, the weirder side of the subject. Um, we all know Lou tends to stay very much nuts and bolts, facts, the, the congressional stuff, his work in ATIP and such. But Lou says there is no, there would have been no ATIP without OSAP. And we now know OSAP, I suppose, is more of the, the Skinwalker Ranch program and, and all that entail. Yeah, yeah. Even though there were some other aspects of it as well. But that's that was the gist, especially from the book with Lakatsky, Knapp and, and Kelleher. And it detailed events at Skinwalker Ranch. I reckon it's one of those areas, because Lou, I think, for one or two of the questions said, I don't know much about that, so can't really answer. I think this is one of those where he probably knows a lot more than he can go into. But it's either a case of really important aggressive NDA issues or it's stuff that they were, it was just purely conversational and he doesn't want to put it out there because there's little in the way of evidence he could produce to back anything up or point us in that direction but as we've heard that you know Gary Nolan coming out and saying that 25% of the subjects in, in certain uh, studies have died from from various incidents one of the incidents that was recorded in the book uh, and Colm Kelleher mentioned on our podcast as well was a blue orb flew through uh, an official shoulders while he was driving with his kid in the car uh, and very soon after got a very rare form of, of cancer and, and illness and luckily they caught it and they could cure him but 25 percent of the folks involved even if that's four people and one's dead is is 25 percent too many for this so yeah that's and that's an interesting one Lou, Lou around here talked about the northern lights and kind of pointed out how once they were considered supernatural but now it's just a natural thing that we understand it's a phenomena and there are all these kind of you know the electromagnetic fields interact and voila uh it, it's one of those um you know understanding the monsters at the edge of the map he, he spoke about it before with these big sea creatures and things and it's clear that there's a kind of a natural order to things that we're not seeing because we're not privy to this classified data uh, in the briefings. But Lou repeatedly uh, throughout this interview talks about the fact that everyone that's had the classified briefing in Congress would have seen what Lou saw as part of ATIP. And I think that's very telling because people keep thinking that these people are being shown planes from a far distance and are being confused, uh, which is just crazy to think uh, that so many people could be, you know, hoodwinked like this. Uh, the truth is there's a classified report that we didn't see. Um, and we, we got told that these things exist, that there were 143 cases they couldn't solve. So beyond that are the juicy details. And this is what con Congress got. Um, so yeah, it's it's really cool that they're able to talk about this link between the two programs. Uh, Lou mentions the sticky portfolio here, which is a, a phrase that kind of keeps coming up. That's a favorite of yours, Dan. I know it that. is. Yeah, uh, just because it's it's the name for the hitchhiker effect, but it seems to kind of allude to some more weirdness to do with the phenomena that it just kind of sticks to you as, as you investigate it. I remember as putting together our first Lou Elizondo interview back in February 2020, uh, February 2021 even. And um, I remember that was something you were very keen on bringing up at the time as well. So yeah. and I know I know Lou gave a, a good answer to that back then. So you can check that one back out in the archives, folks. Um, for me, that's pretty much all from the Lou interview, Dan. Um, is there anything else you wanted to bring up or just uh, people go oh, listen? Only the, the kind of idea at the end where Lou was talking about how disruptive technology can, you know, throw the world and throw development. But he, he emphasized that we can't just think of the stupidest things that people can do with it. It has to be about the best things we can do with it as well. And it always is with technology. You know, we have the atom bomb, we have nuclear power providing light and power and heat to millions mm -hmm. of people. Um, so we have to remember that both those things can happen. It's not just about talking to people like they're stupid. 
we we yeah. can we can either just let this roll out and be awful or we can lead by example and, and i think that's his hope um and and it filled me with a a positive vibe for 2022 couple of stories before we we're going to finish off chatting about the linda bolton how appearance on theories of everything uh just before that two stories that link into i suppose what we've talked about with uh with lou and george knapp is uh the swedish drones story um a few of you got in touch and asked us to share our thoughts on this there were basically drones buzzing various sites around sweden um, over the course of a period of time and there's been various investigations into it and other reports over over the last couple of years with sightings sometimes 400 miles apart um, very much a, an unknown this is why I suppose we hadn't touched on it earlier it wasn't big breaking news but I imagine this is something far more common than we we probably hear about um, from from various places around the world but essentially there are unknown objects potentially drones potentially not um, buzzing around nuclear facilities dan and i would think it's very unlikely to be civilian drones messing about with with nuclear power stations and those sorts of areas because i i would have sort of expected in this day and age some of those places to have anti-drone measures for for fear of someone crashing one into you know one of those chimneys or one of those buildings or doing some damage or even for for spying reasons as well but it's, it's an interesting one. We know the connection with UAP and, and you know, the nuclear. You talked about the anti-neutrino stuff before as well. Any thoughts on the Swedish drone stuff? Uh, it's it's interesting because you've got everything with Russia happening at the moment. And some people think that it's to do with that. Um, all we can really say is that there have been drones reporting. Whether that's, you know, people have used the word quadcopter and fixed wing drones. Um, so it's not necessarily in the same way as they would say, oh, the UAP is swamp gas. Um, you know, it's it might not be dismissive, um, but it's just another one of these unknowns that we kind of have to let spin and not knee-jerk reaction to. It doesn't matter whether it's UAP or whether it's drones, it still needs to be figured out because it's potentially really, really dangerous. It's a really serious incident. Um, I, I also heard that it's someone uh, talk about maybe they're monitoring a potential nuclear leak uh, from from a plant there, which I thought was an interesting idea because you could do it like that. Um, but I mean, to that, I'd just say that Sweden were the country that kind of alerted everyone to what happened in Chernobyl when they detected it. So I, you know, they've convinced me that they're not the kind to sweep that under the rug. Yeah. Uh, and linked to that as well, I suppose, was the news coming out uh, about Havana syndrome, where reports from, from the US are indicating more than likely that it's not an attack by a, a foreign adversary. Now, again, this doesn't automatically lean it to being extraterrestrial in nature or, or something. It could still be very much a human explanation um, or a, a phenomenon on the Earth that we're not aware of. But it's Havana syndrome is one of those terms I think we're going to hear more of in the coming year because I think it's got enough mainstream traction over the last year or so that there will be serious journalists looking to pick up this story. What my hope is is, is that, I mean, hopefully it doesn't happen to anyone else because it sounds pretty horrendous and pretty horrific but if you get some serious journalists who are picking this up from a foreign affairs point of view or a major political point of view that they just by being involved with it get some breadcrumbs or drawn into the ufo topic and subject as part of it and they they look at the links they look at the potential and we get some serious reporting from people who otherwise may or may not have reported on it like more was cool tarts you know, as much as Ross is larger than life and a character and great to talk to, there might even be some more drier, you know, less charismatic people out there who start reporting on UFOs in a very, very serious way as well, which can only be a good thing for the, the subject. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Um, the, the news was interesting. It was uh, that they, they looked at about a thousand cases and apparently the majority were explained by stress or natural causes, which I guess would be the cricket explanation that they uh, had a little while back. Um, they're still looking into about two dozen cases um, where they say that foreign uh, state can't be ruled out. But again, it seems to be that we've got a data pile that can largely be explained by prosaic means, you know, akin to drone kind of data. But there are these outliers that are really intriguing and seem to kind of signify something new and something we don't understand. And as we look into this more, we're probably going to start learning a bit more about, you know, this phenomena, what microwaves do to us, so on and so forth. Uh, but I was relieved to see that CIA director um, 
said that basically they're not done at all. Um, so there's more news ahead of us about that. Excellent. And to finish off, Dan, uh, Linda Moulton Howe appeared on the Theories of Everything podcast. We interviewed, and do you know what? We've been very lucky to keep in touch with the, the very, very lovely Kurt Jai Mungo of, of said YouTube channel. It just passed 100,000 subscribers a couple of weeks ago, it seems, uh, and already it's on 131,000. That's just taking off. And Kurt's a, a fantastic interviewer. He has a wonderful knowledge and patience for a range of subjects as well. And for all the various topics and sub topics and subjects, I can't even pronounce half the, the areas to do them justice. He has an interest now in, in UFOs and he's bringing that into the conversation in his own unique way. Needless to say, if you look at his, his page, I've just opened it quickly just now. If you look at some of his other videos, his most popular videos tend to be that the UFO, Consciousness, UAP, Tom DeLong, um, 315,000. Uh, Linda Moulton Howe in one day is on 64,000, whereas the video uploaded the day before is on 6,500. So I, there is a huge audience. It, it's for... a testament to, I think, both Kurt's approach, because he talks to, you know, very serious people about mm. very in very serious ways. You know, he, he approaches with curiosity and... and kind of talks out the ideas there's no judgment kind of in there and and i love watching that and seeing that those videos are, are you know more viewed i i think that kind of shows that there's a lot of people out there who want this serious conversation but there's only places like this that they can find it right um you, you know the, these people are going to be served as we go forward and there's just more and more stuff like this yeah, again, just comparison as amazing as I look into it. Like Ross Coulthard three months ago is on 920,000 views. That's going to hit a million soon enough. Uh, Noam Chomsky, that was the month before, is on 48,000. So it's kind of a shame as well because folks like Noam Chomsky, there are some really interesting ideas in the discussions about consciousness and society, yeah. and they're challenging. Like a lot of Kurt stuff, I have to go back and listen to twice, but they're fantastic. You know, they're really kind of fruitful in the way you think about things. Yeah. If you've got an interest in UFOs, go and check out Kurt's channel because he's got some phenomenal interviews on there as well. But there are countless other guests that you may or may not know the names of i'm sure dan will throw out some suggestions if you hit him up if you've got any particular areas you want to hear about um that kurt has done some fantastic interviews with he's got a great unique style he's very very curious about everything as the channel says and he's got a wonderful way of asking questions i wish i said before dan i'm not joking i wish i was as articulate and you know a quarter as intelligent as he is to to do that um we're not going to go into all the controversy surrounding how the interview ended folks you can go and watch it and you've no doubt heard enough about it online um yourself the interview put a, a well-known figure in ufology in the hot seat and how, how do i say this dan um he asked very fair questions and uh I don't think the person being interviewed necessarily appreciated all of the questions. This is why, and I'll just say this, sometimes people ask me, why don't you have this person on the podcast or this person? I think there's an element of, and this isn't just my show, but other shows as well. There there are individuals in this topic and subject who, who just don't put themselves out anymore on most podcasts, not because they're too small or they don't want to have a conversation. It can either be one, they're not being paid to do it, or two, they, it doesn't fit their narrative or how they want to talk about the subject. And when someone from outside the subject, like Kurt, which is fantastic, comes in to question and really probe on why don't you have this evidence or what about this, rather than maybe people like myself and yourself, Dan, who would take things a little bit more at face value, Kurt looks for more and others like Kurt look for more. I would think a Brian Keating and Eric Weinstein, these guys again would be very similar. And the interview kind of went as as I expected it probably would, given given the nature of it. I'm trying to be really polite here and careful with how I word it. If I made sense. Just jump over it. <laughs> jump over it. Yeah. So I I think there are again some UFO celebrities. Let's just let me just name one, okay? Stephen Greer won't come on this podcast and other podcasts like it because they won't like the questions to get. They won't like the listener questions to get. I would be very objective. I'd be respectful, but 
we know there's certain things that aren't going to get answered and yeah that's that's kind of how it goes um these people make a lot of money and a very comfortable living like into the tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars as we've seen from some people's accounts that have been published and that that's great they've made made their money doing that but i think there comes a point does the truth stop and their truth begins and takes over <sighs> yeah does have i made sense with that dan i don't want to just ramble on here um uh, yeah i'd rather not talk about it to be honest are you doing an impression of linda at the end of that interview no i i just i i don't <laughs> i don't okay. think drama is content so i no. prefer to focus on the but, the good information from the interview which i think so what was that had plenty uh we we had um you asked a really interesting question about linda's kind of position in the ufology and how she feels that's changed over the decades because it has you know as as we've had the internet people put different things up make cases kind of different approaches and different evidence um and she what was the phrase uh it was ufology means nothing to me which i thought was pretty provocative i wanted to ask you how you, how that made you feel i think that I, we we know people that don't like the term ufology as well don't we and there's listeners yeah. that get in touch and ufology has a different meaning to different people i think it's like when i ask that disclosure what does it mean to you it's like i i don't see ufology personally when i talk about ufology it's just anyone who's involved in the subject of ufos but i think the way linda took it was ufology as in that old school of you just write books on aliens and you've got a narrative and but she does and and she she goes to the expos and the conferences and and has the talks and is on documentaries like the observers with the same talking heads you know the the greers richard dolans um the, these types of people so I, I i didn't totally get why she said ufology means nothing to me i'm sure if you again no problem with anyone making money on this topic it's not my point but ufology's made linda moulton howe a very comfortable living and lifestyle over the years it's allowed her to travel the world which would be incredible you know dan you're getting to do that for a very small taste of that and people have been lucky that they've helped you do that as well to be involved in this subject though and i just i was a little not disrespectful to me but just to the question of you know ufology means nothing that's a nothing answer i would have absolutely probed more on that as to well, is ufology not bought your house? And you can, know, can you imagine Justin Bieber saying, "Music means nothing to me"? Yeah, uh -huh, that's <laughs> yeah, great, great analogy. Yeah, that's it. It's like, well, it does. It's maybe you don't like the the way people stigmatize ufology, but it's it's what you've been a part of and you're, you're inextricably linked with. That's going to be your legacy. Um, it got you on documentaries and it's got you attached to no doubt many other TV series that you've been involved with and Ancient Aliens. Are you telling me Ancient Aliens isn't ufology? She was happy to talk about that and her investigative journalism. Again, I suppose someone like Kurt would be going in with, like I would have as well, investigative journalism with anonymous sources is really, really difficult when that's all you've got to to quote on with especially with some of the more incredible claims as well but yeah yeah 100 percent agree I, I think it would have been interesting to hear about how she vets those sources um and maybe kind of distinguishes between information she thinks is unreliable and reliable not just because you, you know you want to catch her out but i want to know those methods as well you know it might be helpful to the community it might be helpful to let somebody know who maybe is thinking about coming out and telling their story what methods they can use to kind of communicate these things securely even uh, just like what's what's linda learned in her time like and that was partly part of my question you know what what have you learned as we're in 2022 and things have changed and the landscape's different to what it was in the 80s the 90s the, even the 2000s you know what could she pass on in terms of knowledge and experience and what are some of the pitfalls and mistakes that she has made I mean, God, Dan, I could rhyme off any number of mis uh, mistakes I've made in the early days making this podcast from like an interviewing style or questioning style or technical style. How many times have I released an episode in the early days where I never had my the correct mic attached to the recording? So it was essentially recording from a webcam that was too far away from me and sounded awful. It's, it's these little things where you go, ah, okay, you learn from it and you move on and people would be interested in that. But I think maybe too much ego involved at this point for for some people like linda greer others to to maybe accept that they can still make mistakes or they have made mistakes yeah and, and i i think a part of it is 
and you and I spend a lot of time doing this, just forming questions in a way where we kind of try and get an actual answer as opposed to just a reaction, you know? Um, and it's not and always perfect. No, no, no. Um, but that's kind of the issue with live streaming when you kind of take it, questions from the audience. Sometimes they are yeah. phrased in the best way um, and they can be, be misconstrued, you know? Yeah. Um, but it it was what it was. I, I hope Kurt continues to do the UFO podcast that he's been doing. He has um, obviously contacts and a huge name. And when you see someone like Kurt's channel with 130 plus thousand subscribers, he will get people far easier to go on those channels than than we can or other channels that do do what we do as well so yeah. not that we don't keep asking and but his his next guest uh or one of his next guests i should say i'm not sure if it's his next next guest uh is salvatore pie uh the mm. author of the ufo patents and there's been a lot of discussion about those so that's sure to be a, a really interesting discussion about whether that system works whether it was demonstrated you know what that guy's doing now uh because he went to work for the air force after this so very curious kind of you, you know story there and, and i'm sure that'll be enlightening yeah and, and on that interview if you've listened to it we discussed it in the discord chat with with the listeners and it's split opinion on different people and again it's fine to disagree folks some of you listening to this will agree and disagree with with what dan and i think about it as well it's it's i suppose one of the reasons again we we have a range of content on this topic and you can yeah. go and listen to other shows and channels and and put those kind of opinions together as well so yeah well, well done to Kurt for that interview um fair play to Linda for going on that channel um uh, and putting herself out there to a, to a large audience for for that conversation and discussion as well so yeah uh, they, yeah I'd love to hear people's thoughts on it they, there were some interesting things mentioned about the bismuth magnesium arts parts um the kind of the chain of custody of that over time has been kind of all over the place you know in many different articles and things like that but in this interview you kind of get the whole thing from linda's point of view um and she talks about why she sold it to ttsa uh which i'd never heard her kind of say before but she she just explained that basically she doesn't have the capability to do the testing on it herself so when the army kind of say yeah hey we can throw terror herds at that and kind of see see what happens um she thought hey maybe that's a good idea she she even alluded to maybe still having a piece of that um so that if they prove that that's true then she kind of still has a piece to go public with uh which i thought was kind of you know interesting um i'd like to ask her if she does definitely have a piece and see it and and it's also fair dan to say that you know she sold it for was it thirty thousand dollars thirty thousand dollars yeah yeah so again in your late 70s you don't have that equipment you've got a cool piece of something potentially very special potentially not then why not hand it off take take that money that you can and en enjoy your life and, and go on a nice holiday treat grandkids all that kind of stuff that you would you would look to do so um so yeah so i would recommend people go and check it out check out kurt's channel subscribe he's a really good guy and um please let us know your thoughts and we'll, we'll discuss them in future um uh, dan just before we finish up anything you want to add no, I think that's everything. I guess we'll do another breaking news, you know, in an hour if there, anything else happens. Yeah, I, I, ho I hope not. We're, we're too busy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so listen, just to remind folks that coming up this week, I've got John Ramirez back for a listener questions show with him because we didn't get too many of the listener questions last time. So email those over to UFO, UAPAM at gmail.com. Or if you DM me those, I can I can take them. But ideally email with the, the name of the guest and the subject that really helps me out. Um, I'm getting more and more stuff sent over, which again is fantastic. But you know, it's a gift and a curse because stuff's going into my spam and I'm missing stuff and all that kind of thing as well. Um, then Tim McMillan is joining us next Friday and that'll be out the following week, but you'll get that early access and ad free on Patreon or if you sign up via Apple Premium or if you're on Spotify, you have to search for that UFO podcast premium, remember? And also we'll be recording before Dan goes off to Columbia, Tom part 1.5, which is the listener section of the Tom DeLong part one. Oh, profile. that's a good idea. I like the 1.5 thing because, yeah. yeah. Let me just clear up again, folks, because I got a tiny bit of abuse, didn't I, Dan? A for people, people who thought it was an interview with Tom DeLong, even though the description clearly said it was me and you profiling, <laughs> the, and it said profile Tom DeLong, um, some people 
set. I, I don't mind abuse, folks. It doesn't bother me. But it was funny where look, I messaged you going, people who still think it's an interview with Tom DeLong. <laughs> did, did they not think I would have been building this up for ages if I was like, Tom DeLong's coming on the podcast? Yeah. So, yes. The, and, and he did do everything he could to uh, to make that clear in a lot of different ways, especially once people started asking about it. I put it in yeah. the YouTube chat and stuff like that. So, yeah, just it's we're we're profiling a bunch of big players in uap and they're going to be called profile shows tom is the first one and we're up to uh where he launched ccsa yeah and that'll be part two we'll record that before dan goes off to columbia so that'll be available soon as well and um, but also this week as a special bonus just to waste some more of my time i mean take up some more of my time dan and Vinny are both going to jump on and we're going to record a chat about uh, their trip their preparation for it what they're expecting it'll be a really casual conversation as well uh, i'm looking forward to that um we might even do like a youtube live with it dan potentially yeah why not yeah because that'd be fun it, yeah, and then we'll release the audio for you anyway, folks. But again, just on you know their, their thoughts and feelings before they head out to Columbia. And while they're there, we'll, we'll have some content released as well from, from Dan. I've got an idea I've not said to him yet, but I'm going to, I'm going to pitch to him after this. So, nice. But yeah, that's all coming up in the next week or so. So again, if you can and you want to support and listen to Early Access, Patreon, Apple premium spotify etc at the youtube channel you can sign up for early access and add free stuff there as well or you can just listen to the stuff free there's plenty of it comes out pretty regular please get in touch all of that jazz it's been a bit of a busy start to the new year we all thought it would be quiet here's to next week that is all for this week's show thank you very much for listening please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform you can like retweet and subscribe that would all be very much appreciated the shows are being uploaded onto youtube as we speak more and more you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that ufo podcast to access shows ad free as well please get in touch on twitter facebook instagram that ufo podcast of course on twitter it's at ufo uap am and again folks as always keep looking up you never know what you might see it wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer more like a hubcap designed by chaucer a little baroque and quite steampunk like alice was playing bass for the parliament of Fox. the little fucker hovered right at the side of my window and when i shoved out the screen he made it an issue Expecting me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little more. Meditative game of state full on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. nearly kissed myself and I climbed out the window after the elf and I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head and everything was weird and everything was red and I called up my boys they thought this was noise they thought it was a dream they thought it was my toys they thought it was my problems and they think I should take care of me and I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me Consider your lies, consider your life, consider your eyes.